Hello, everybody. This is Scott Roberts with Kent Martz and Jerry Hubble. Uh, How y'all doing? Here with the Open Go To Community Live, episode 33, or 33 and a third, maybe. Um, anyways. <laughs> Uh, uh, <laughs> going around and around at 33 and a third instead that's of 45. A that's a slow record. That's a slow record. That's right. That's right. So um hope you guys had a uh, a good Tuesday so far. Um, uh, and uh, we are here to talk about our main subject today with different scenarios is how to troubleshoot the PMC-8. And so, um, Jerry, uh, well, both you and Kent have gone through lots of troubleshooting exercises with customers. Uh, where do we kind of start with this? Well, I wanted to start with the basic outline of what tr what we mean by troubleshooting and to get everybody on the same page for some, some terms. I'll try not to be too technical, but uh, there'll be some concepts I'll introduce uh, to help us understand the the way we troubleshoot the PMC-8 system, I guess. And it's tip, it's really how you troubleshoot a lot of different systems, but uh, but I'll introduce this to our customers so they can understand why we ask the questions we do. Basically, that's a big part of it. Mm -hmm. you know, they'll, they'll ask, what do you need to know that for? Why, why is that important? You know, they don't quite understand. Why do you need my credit card information and my blood type? That's right. Yeah, that'll help us troubleshoot and be more effective at getting the job done. That's right. So let me, uh, is there any ad, any comments on that, Kent? Do you have any add, add to that? I just try and when I start talking to people about it, I say, look, you know, we need to conduct the scientific process here. Change one variable, study what happens. And, you know, like Janie Mee Heineman of Mythbusters fame said, the difference between play and science is when you do science, you write it down. So yeah, we're going to write it down because that's a big you, thing. Mm -hmm. It really is. It's a great saying because it, you, you have, if you don't write it down, you have to remember what you did. So if you're taking test frames to find out if something's caused by a field flattener or the camera or something, frame number one, I did this frame number two, I did this rotated the camera 90 degrees or rotated the film flattener. So, You've got to go through that process of, of documenting what you did so that we we don't have to guess that we have data and from that we can start doing some science and narrow down the process change one variable study it then change another one so right right so i created this little slideshow it's not very good it's just a basic thing i just whipped it up in the last half hour or so yeah where's the fancy background I know there's no fancy background. So this is it's invisible. <laughs> it's invisible. You can only see it with a special well, my, filters. my color is clear. So this is pretty close to yeah. what I like. So this is basically an introduction to figuring out what the heck is wrong with my mount. Mm hmm. <laughs> so great. Uh, hopefully, we'll. We'll be able to walk you through some things, some scenarios, so, some basic stuff for you to try out and to write down and to understand. So James, the astrophotographer says it's a process of elimination. That's true. But when I start calling and asking questions, oftentimes people haven't written it down. And so they can't tell me what they eliminated. And so right. I will literally start asking questions and start a file and write down uh, what we're doing so we can go back and track. So who do we have on the show today in the audience, Scott? Uh, we'll get that out. Oh, of we've got, first. um, we have, uh, Michael Scarrett. Uh, he says, hello, Michael Wiesner. Hello, everyone. Everyone from cloudy Southern Arizona. I didn't know they had clouds there. <laughs> um, Wolfgang says, good evening, all and greetings from Germany. Uh, Nico says, uh, from a cloudy and stormy Argentina. Uh, Ansel Puri saying hello to everybody. Um, James, the astrophotographer, says evening, everyone. Bergman Scooter's here. Haskin, Dusty Haskins is here. Cool. Uh, 
Wolfgang is sharing that he had a bad day with PC crash and lost all of his programs. Ouch. Oh, no. Uh, good that the browser works again. Well, that, that's, that's tough. That's really tough. That tough uh, Mr. Thumb 30. Hello, everyone. Sorry to hear about that, Wolfgang. And um, let's see. Uh, Steve Seedentop is here. Yeah. Uh, cloudy and rainy in Atlanta. It's cloudy and rainy in a lot of places. So mm -hmm. pretty interesting. We got clouds here too. Um, Charles Peak just to uh, get a peek at the comet this evening. So Charles Peak checked checked in. And, yeah. Uh, Eduardo oh. Simone. Yeah. And Ken Ken in says, as Doctor Spock would say, if we find everything that isn't. We will surely find out what it is. That's right. That's exactly yep. right. So to start out, I want to just list some some uh, phrases, term, some terms here about some talk about these concepts for troubleshooting. The important thing, the first thing you need to do is understand all the different components of your system. You know what what are the pieces parts? What what uh, what does what? Uh, just make sure you're familiar with with what you have and not just externally um, some of this troubleshooting for mounts especially we may get into the internals of the mount with the gear components and the drivetrain that type of stuff the next thing to 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 understand is a system configuration and this this involves a lot of different types of configuration it's software configuration it's hardware configuration and it's it's basically system settings is a big part of this so and it's important to write this stuff down if you don't have it readily available in the software itself then it's important to write down some of these configuration things that you might have on your mount system uh, so that you know where you're at basically that's part of the system state the system state is the current configuration of the system. Is, that's the way I define it in terms and for this talk. Um, there's also system performance in terms of what do you expect. This, this is what leads you to understanding when you have a problem and identifying a problem. Because sometimes you'll have performance issues that you may not have the skills or knowledge to identify or to, or to recognize or detect but you still may be having a performance problem or you may have things that appear to be performance problems uh, based on your expectations, but that you, that may not actually be a performance problem. Uh, the next thing is uh, the failure modes of the components. So if you understand the physics of how the component works and you've identified these, these uh, components then you, then you should be able to understand how they might fail. Um, that's an important consideration. If you don't understand the component or the system, then you, you may not be able to recognize these failure modes or understand that that's where it's coming from. Basically, that's what it comes down to is you'll recognize a failure mode, say it's not doing X, Y, or Z, and then you say, well, what's where is that happening at? Where is it occurring? So that's why it's important to understand this. Um, and then of course the impact of the failure, that's, that's what people typically report is what it does to me, what it, how it impacts me. I can't, I can't do this or I can't flew to an object accurately. I can't, uh, you know, I can't configure this item because it won't let me or something like that. It's a general statement of how it makes your life miserable. God, that's yeah. exactly you do you hit everybody on this forum I, I, there's going to be a bunch of people say they understand that because mm -hmm. that's the effect how does it, it just made my life miserable right yep so and this is typically what what we know is the impact of the failure that's about all we know until we start asking questions hmm. and then to get more scientific uh, as as kent put it uh, there's a there's a, a formal process called failure modes and effects analysis, which is basically a fancy word for troubleshooting. Uh, and this 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 failure modes and effects analysis 
is a way to analytically define where you might have problems in the future. Okay. And you document it. That's, that's, this is a form um, mm -hmm. as engineering and as engineers, we fill out and if we want to understand what could fail on a system, we'll create this, we'll do this formal analysis and understand, okay, if this has failed, then what caused it? Well, how can we correct it? How do we, can, how do we mitigate it? That type of stuff. So sure. I don't want to get too much into that unless there's some questions about it later on, but that's, that's a way to understand beforehand what could go wrong with a system. So are there any questions about any of these uh, concepts? Mm, I think we're okay. People, um, uh, people would like to see this whole thing in PDF for download later. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is, this is kind of an outline that I created real quick, but I can, I can definitely uh, clean this up and I'm going to show you some drawings here in a minute so, to make it so a little Jerry, you'll put this in the documents on the main page. Uh, it'll think? be in the file section of the main forum under the uh, Explore Scientific official documents. And I'll be showing you, I think I'll be showing you a document here before too long that's in there. All right, <laughs> so we, these are kind of the components that we're talking about. There's more than this, but this is a, this is a selection of stuff that that people are familiar with. The mount has uh, a right ascension worm wheel, a pulley, mm -hmm. uh, motor pulley. I, I left out the deck. The declination also has these things. Um, the controller has motor connections, motor cables, the guide port, um, the antenna connection. There's other components to the controller that the user might typically interact with uh, that could cause a problem maybe. And then under the there's you know the Explore Stars application and the ASCOM driver, so that's kind of a high level view of these components. Um, and what I want to show you now, on the next slide, is a drawing I made up that talks about uh, the performance of I call it the system the PMC8 system performance guide. What the mm -hmm. heck? Get out of the way. And uh, I'm going to zoom up here and I'm going to just talk about these different boxes. So this is a performance diagram and it starts out. So that would get out of the way. I want to zoom back a little bit. Can everybody see that okay? Yeah. That looks real good on the screen. All right. So there's different things. Uh, that Stop the right user. There. Well, that is an unhappy user. That's the international yeah. symbol of an unhappy user. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Ah. So, as an outline, this is this is there's there's a main area. These are the main areas that prevent the near perfect operation of the PMC8 mount in the field. And there's two endpoints. One one endpoint is the user, and the opposite endpoint is the mount uh, performance whether it points to the sky or not. You can see that down here at the bottom. So you want to go from the user to pointing at an object. That's the whole goal, right? And yeah. to be able to look at that accurately and in timely manner. So the user actually has performance errors and uh, he's done wrong configuration inputs. He, he doesn't have uh, full knowledge of everything. He lacks some experience. He maybe lacks some familiarity with the system. He doesn't quite understand the go-to system perhaps, uh, and he's not familiar with any procedures. So these are, these are things that are brought to the picture that causes uh, us not to be able to go from here down to accurate pointing. Now there's a lot of stuff here that involve, that's just those things for the user, but there's a lot of things with the system that are involved, okay? We go from the application software so the errors in the application software, maybe the alignment calculations are not right. The object coordinates are not correct. You have communications drop out. And the application software, I'm not gonna read through all these things, but the application software is supposed to do all these things and have all these things in it. All right. Okay. That's at the application. And I'm, 
I'm pretty much talking more about Explore Stars, but this also is the ASCOM driver uh, in terms of the client for the ASCOM client, I should say. Mm -hmm. The driver software has these elements in it, these types of things. And what you'll see if the driver is having problems is you'll have, again, timing accuracy problems, engineering unit conversion problems. It does real-time calculations. It does position monitoring. So any of these things that aren't doing right will be related to the driver or could be related to the driver. The firmware um, actually brings down to another <clears throat> level. We've got motor control, input commands, you know, so the command language and the watchdog timer and the data output. So we have, we can, we can have, if, if the firmware is not correct, if there's a problem there, then you might have timing issues with the motor pulses. You might have uh, things internally with the logic and the calculations. The inputs may not be interpreted correctly for the PMC-8. It may do the wrong command for some reason. The output values are not right. You know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of things that could go on if the firmware isn't correct. And then we start getting down to the um, electronic hardware, the motors, the drivers, uh, the processor that's on the PMC-8. We could have a motor failure. We could have temperature problems, you know, driving the current. We could have a processor failure, a connectivity error. Uh, you know, the physical connections could be bad. Electrical power, that's another big area that uh, can be bad. Mm-hmm. And then we finally get to the bottom, which is really, so if, even if all these things are perfect, right? This is a long chain of stuff. All this stuff has to work perfect to get to the, your final endpoint, where you have the mount mechanical hardware, which is the gears, the pulleys and the bearings, basically, and the mount body. Um, so you've got, these things can cause problems, manufacturing quality, gear alignment, bearing quality, mating surfaces, wear and tear, flexure, stability, temperature effects, lubrication, fasteners, you know, if the axes aren't orthogonal, and then physical alignment. So that mm -hmm. gives you an idea of what areas can go wrong. There's hey, a lot Jerry, that can go wrong. Jerry, is orthogonal uh, one of the islands near Guadalcanal? Orthogonal. I don't know if I pr – that's supposed to be an I probably. Orthogonal, yeah, that's an that's a island. That's right. Yeah. So these things, you know, there's a different, there's two different areas of uh, problems too. One is, one is a design issue, one's a broke fix issue. So for the PMC-8, unless I introduce a change to the firmware or to the hardware design, uh, this stuff's been pretty well validated with a lot of users. Uh, so there's, we typically don't find design issues. Scott, how many units are out there? How many PMC, units? How many PMC eight units are on the mark are on the in the wild? I couldn't give you a number right now off the top of my head. It's a lot. I mean, we've got five hundred members almost. Yeah, so, most people most people that um, own something though don't join a user group. You know, right. that's that's my right. point. Yeah, so it's true. I, I'm getting at the point that. There's a lot of units out there yeah. that are being used successfully. Yeah, right. so we would – and the design issues that showed up early on, they've what little design changes we've done over the last three years have been – have taken care of those. So right now, until we introduce a new, a new version of something or make a substantial change, the, the design uh, problems are ba basically non-existent for the PMC-8. So that means that all that's left are broke fix types of issues. Now, broke fix can mean physically or, you know, configuration broke fix or the other areas that we talked about for broke fix. Um, let me go back to the PowerPoint. So read that section on that drawing. That? Read that note one again. Okay. I mean, we haven't looked at what those notes say. Read those notes. Okay, Please. the main area, the main areas that prevent near perfection. I yeah. I got to respell perfect too because that's perfect. 
operation of the PMC mount in the field involved two endpoints of this involve the two endpoints of this uh, structure, the user. So we wanna go from the user, his desire, to point at an object and see it through this telescope down to the endpoint, which is where the mount actually does that. Okay. So since the components in the hi hierarchy between the user and the mechanical hardware are used on different mount types, uh, on the different, you know, G11, Axis 2, Axis 100. I misspelled 100 also. And Somebody have needs an editor. <laughs> I know. And have been demonstrated. You spell 100. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so they've been demonstrated to function properly. So the problems that we're talking about are broke fix issues in this in this diagram. Mm -hmm. now I, want, I want to focus on and have been demonstrated to function correctly. Yes. Right, properly. That's something that... And have that been we, demonstrated to function properly, right. So my point is, when we when I have to deal with customers, they're approaching it from, it's broke. And the, the propensity right. is, is to blame the box or blame the mount because psychologically, we're all programmed to externalize, I think, errors. And it's mm -hmm. difficult sometimes to recognize that it may be something you're doing. And, and, and I noticed that uh, Wolfgang points this out. Uh, he commented, once one of my axes didn't move after one hour, I found out I forgot the uh, connection, wa connection wire. Table, so yeah. he, he had not hooked up his deck control or his RA control and it wouldn't move. And little things like that sometimes you know it's it's not the mount it's the user but it's hard to embrace that from a user standpoint i understand that and we're patient and work through asking questions right the best way around that type of thing is is system familiarity and and going through an understanding not just seeing that it works based on your you know your endpoint interface which is the tablet or the computer, that's that's where you know that the system's working or not, is at that endpoint interface where the user looks at the at the computer. But you need to understand, okay, just because the computer says it's doing X, Y, and Z, I need to look at the mount and see what it's actually doing and understand that that's the case. Because the computer will lie to you. And the fact that this is an open loop control system lies to you because even, like you said, if the, the computer will show you, oh yeah, I slewed to that position. I'm not lying to you. I, I know I'm there. But the mount with the cable disconnect and says, no, nope, you're not there. What are you talking about? Cone error. <laughs> or you have cone error. You're or you have cone error. Or you have other things. Right. Exactly. That's, that's mechanical. So you need to understand the end-to-end -end process on how the system works, not just, not just the application that you're using. And right. so that's that's note number two, effectively. Yes. Astro Beard says, I couldn't tell if there was a two-speed or not. I'm sure that can be replaced. I'm wondering what the threads are. Oh, okay. They're talking, they're talking amongst themselves. Oh, okay. <laughs> Which is fine. Yeah, uh, yeah. Somebody wanted to know if the Explore Scientific has a Discord account. Uh, we did set up a Discord account, but we used it only for an event that we attended. Um, and that's because they required everybody in the event to use Discord. Uh, we do not uh, use Discord in customer service. It would be yet another platform that we would have to monitor. Uh, you know, so currently right now we are uh, certainly monitoring Facebook, um, you know, uh, thousands of emails that we get uh, a week calls. A week. Yeah. yeah. Right. So this, uh, um, it is, uh, and then they're also doing live chat. So we do recommend if you're trying to get in touch with us directly is to call us or a live chat with us or to send us an email at service at explore scientific.com. Uh, we also have a portal customer service portal. It's, uh, that's true. That is true. That's that if, if you're trying to get a replacement part or you need a repair, uh, the portal um, I'm uh, that you can find uh, does uh, really help. It's explore scientific 
www.supportsync.com. It's explorescientific.supportsync.com. Uh, uh, support Sync. Explore Scientific dot support sync s y n c dot com got it all right, parts so requests problems all that stuff can go through there as well okay good so i created this cheat sheet a year or two ago i think it's out there on the forum somewhere i'll, I'll make sure it's out there I'll, I'll post this and like i said this whole uh this little PowerPoint, I'll create it as a PDF for people to have too out there. But this is kind of like a cheat sheet that shows you what things to think about when you're looking at the configuration of the system. Uh, so and it, it's basically based on a use case uh, type of thing. And that's one of, the, one of the terms we use internally at Explore Scientific is use case, where it's how do you want to use the system? How do you... How do you want to configure it for to accomplish your goal? Um, and so we've got outlined here on this diagram uh, some options for the use case, whether you're using Explore Stars or the ASCOM client, and uh, and then some other uh, other information that's here. So these are things that uh, you need to consider when you're configuring the system. It's just like a cheat sheet, quick and dirty thing to look at. Um, it gives you some information. Uh, there's a couple of notes here that might, I could probably update this a little bit too, but it gives you some screenshots on what the, con on what you're going to do too with the, it's got the old version of the configuration manager here and it's got the, um, couple of pages there and then it's got the driver, uh, set mm -hmm. That's like a little sheet that you can use to reference if you have a question or want to know how things. I had another diagram I was going to, I couldn't find it before this session that shows the all the connections between the PMC8 and other things. But I know that other users have created this document out on a forum. I can't remember who it was. They, they did a great diagram that shows all the different uh, connections from the different pieces, uh, how they're all stacked together. I made a similar diagram, but I haven't, uh, I got to put it out there also. Uh, let's see. So I guess uh, these are, we talked about the components. We talked about where the failures might occur. Uh, so let's actually talk about failure modes, okay? So this is where we can start to get into to some stories, I think. Uh, Kent. Let me go to this first. Let me go to this next slide before we get into the failure modes. Well, let's talk about what the impact of the failure, the failure effects are. These are this things probably, that get reported. Yeah. These are things that get reported to us, right? This is not a, yep. a large number of them, but it's a, examples of what we get. Yeah, you know, stops moving. You know, the first thing I start thinking about is, um, you know, has a belt come off, which is literally never happened, but I check it first because it's the most obvious one, but it's, I literally have never had it happen. Mm -hmm. uh, makes noise while moving. Uh, where's it coming from? What's the noise sound like? Get me video or audio with the sound good so I can hear it and see it. Because a lot of times if I can hear it or see it, I can really get a good diagnosis right off the bat. And, yeah, and you uh, recognize it because it's one of those standard failure modes that we've we've seen and we know what it is. Right. And makes noise while stopped. That then points to uh, binding with the worm ring gear or some other cord wrapped up stops it from moving or something like that, which has never happened. But that's <laughs> a possibility. But mm -hmm. generally that's going to be the uh, a worm gear ring gear interface is really tight mesh. Right, and that's that's a lot of our our problem with the mounts and report in terms of what people report. Uh, right. I don't know if you want to talk about. Uh, well, I'm just I want to say that Alex does an excellent job of checking out every single mount that we ship out to our that's dealers true. and to our customers. And, and people so, don't believe that. I right, mean, I've so, had people go, "Really? I don't believe that." And yeah. 
every single mouth that leaves this building. Yeah, he sets it up, he powers it up, he runs it. So he checks, he pulls it out, mm -hmm. he makes sure he can connect wired. Well, he makes sure he can connect wirelessly with a, with an iPad. Then he connects it, switches it, connects it wired to make sure it connects was wi connects wired, switches it back, sex sets up the the mount. Uh, runs the motors in right ascension and declination uh, and then checks the gear mesh to make sure the gear mesh is correct and then parks it and packs it up and puts it in. So yep. when it leaves here, every single one of them leaves here with a good gear mesh and working. It right. amazes me what happens between here and the user sometimes. Right. So that's something to keep in mind uh, for any future customers that are watching this video uh, to, you know, think about when you unpack it, look for any damage to the box at all that you might be able to identify. And then, and if you, if you see a failure with the mount, if it's wanged up a little bit where it does, where it binds up, mm -hmm. please report, please report the, uh, how you, how you receive the box to us so we can understand, uh, that there was something going on maybe with the shipping. Right. Yeah, but that's not always the case. I've seen perfectly good looking boxes that were really uh, misused um, where oh, really? the product was damaged on the inside. And you, you just can't believe that that could happen in shipping. You go, no, that, that had to happen at the factory. They knew it was broken. Somebody was just having a bad day and threw it in there. Okay. So today, had a guy who, who took a trip with his uh, telescope in a hard siding case. Yeah. Uh, he gets home, uh, goes out to, after a certain period of time, whatever, open up the case. Uh huh. Notice that the front element was shattered. Wow. Had a, well, it had scalloped, had taken scallops off the uh, one, the bottom okay. corner of it. Yeah. So in the case during shipping, Somebody dropped that thing so hard in a foam filled custom one of our cases Ouch. that broke it with mm -hmm. no damage to the box. So weird things can happen in shipping. Weird things can right. happen in shipping. Wow. So talking about controllers, no SSID, you know, we fart we start looking at the first thing I do is we start looking at the uh, Wi Fi environment is what I've started doing. Uh, they can't stay connected or really intermittent. I get up and it works fine one night and the next night it won't connect. And I, it is, it's not stable. Something's wrong with it. Uh, so we start looking at the Wi-Fi connection. Um, a lot of the, the expression is uh, how they, they will have used the configuration manager and uh, inadvertently switched it to wired connection, but yet they don't know it. And so they're in the wired mode, but they're trying to use Explore Stars. They can connect the wireless to the mount, but nothing will move. And and you'll it, get the time please wait message. The please too. wait message, correct. And and but it was working last night. And so yesterday, in fact, I went in somebody and they had inadvertently changed it to a wired connection and changed it back and bam slick as a whistle started working again so uh, that goes back to that troubleshooting thing where you understand the state of the system and it takes a while it took me a while to be able to and to the look system at configuration the, right and, and what i did was i literally sat here when the phones weren't ringing and uh had a pmc8 system set up and i would just switch it back and forth and disconnect it and uh, just do it over again, switch back and forth, disconnect, re reconnect, start, uh, ASCOM connects, uh, CDC, run the mount, disconnect, shut everything down, switch to wireless, run explore stars. And I just did that over and over again for days until it became internalized. And I tell people that yeah. you should sit in your house and do the same play thing with, with explore stars right. and just while you're watching TV tonight during commercials, play with it. You know, and just run it to whatever and watch TV and then come back and do it again and or or whatever. 
and try and internalize those operations. So when you go out in darkness, it becomes easy. Yeah. Well, Muscle memory. Is, right. Your goal as a user is to correct these performance errors on your, on your end. Uh, now, it'll, I'm not saying it takes a lot of work to do some of these things. It may just take an hour's worth of playing with the system to get fully familiar with it. Uh, experience is a relative thing. You could be experienced. You can run it inside your house for a day or two and become experienced running the thing and connecting it up and, and configuring it. And then, and then it'll just work for you. That, the last thing is when you get out in the field is that it will, uh, then you'll be able to identify if it's pointing correctly. That's the last part of it. But in terms of familiarity with the system, you can do all this stuff indoors, I think. I uh, think you should. Yeah, you know. I do too. You know, so you um, want to minimize this stuff here in the red. And, and, and this is not just true of Explore Scientific's PMC-8. This is any telescope that's got electronics on it. Right, anything, okay? right. This is yeah. any brand, any, you know, you want to get really used to that system so that you know it, okay? Because they all have a learning curve, um, you know, uh, and some of them may seem more intuitive to an individual versus another. But again, that's even on an individual basis. Um, but, uh, you know, understanding the system that you want to set up with the PMC-8 uh, by almost daily uh, dinking with it, tweaking it, whatever, you know, is very, very valuable when you get out into the field. You know, think of the Apollo astronauts. How many hours did they go through uh, every process uh, from going to launch to landing and all the rest of it. Yeah, hundreds of times. Oh, yeah. when I talked to Buzz Aldrin about being on the moon, he said, you know, he said it was like it was almost like a dream. He said, because everything was muscle memory. We already knew exactly the thing we were going to do next, mm -hmm. you know, because they had done it so many times, you know. So Steve Seedentop says, uh, oh, this is very good advice. I advise everybody actually to do what Steve says. Play with it during the show so you annoy your spouse. That's a very <laughs> wise piece of advice right there. I, everybody do that. I think Steve lives on the edge is what I think. So, <laughs> But he also gives this crazy, I mean, he gives that solid piece of advice and then he gives this craziness and he says, don't set anything up for the first time in the dark. That's crazy, man. Get it. <laughs> wait for it to get dark. Then unbox it and take it outside and figure it out. With That's no light. To do no it. red no lights light. either. Nothing. No red. Dark. Come on, Steve, dark. man. Why are you being crazy like that? I, I, uh, I talk about this. Dark. I talk about this in my first book. I talk about my initial experience and what my expectations were. I, I expected to be able to get the uh, equipment shipped to me and get home in the afternoon and put it together and then bring it outside at night and just start using it. Yeah. That was really, you know, because I thought I knew, you know. All right. So, All right. so a Wolfgang has an interesting point. Um, you know, on full moons, most of us aren't doing astronomy. Wolfgang says most of the full moon nights I use to study my setup of the mount. So in other words, he's going out under a full moon Oh yeah, or in the house using the full moon to continue his routine, staying up late, you know, keep in that 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 sleep pattern healthy, and uh, that's a great idea. That's, well, that's a great a good, way to use a full especially moon. Especially if you yeah, if you're an astrophotographer, you wanna you wanna practice your craft. You don't have to have perfect guys to practice no. using no, your no, equipment, no. right? And you don't right. want to use those nights. You don't want to waste those nights learning your equipment. That's you right. Learn it when it's when you have the full moon out, and you can just take pictures and look at them and understand your settings and your configuration and everything. So Get that stuff nailed down before you have a perfect night where you're spending half the night fussing you, with your equipment. And you don't get any pictures. You collect no right. data. Right. So uh, Mike Wiesner has also has some crazy talk. This is crazy talk. I always <laughs> tell new users to read the manual three times and play with the system inside your house uh, during the daytime. Crazy talk again. Yeah, that's, Mike, that's, that's, crazy. that's too logical and, and too, uh, you know, that's not going to work. 
Yeah, basically, yeah, right. Why would you set yourself up? For Why success? would you read the instructions? You yeah, know, you don't want to set yourself off. up for success. I mean, no. yeah, it, it, because I mean, Mister Thump Thirty says, always read the, the instructions. I wasted a night with my two with my new PhD two guiding, thinking it was not working. Only to later find out, I just waited for the yellow out. I had just waited for the yellow lines to calibrate and turn green. He just wasn't waiting for something to happen before pushing another button. I see. And patience in astronomy is a virtue. And it'll teach Learn you. Learn to be it'll, patient. It'll teach you patience. Yes, yes, it will. It will it'll beat you into the ground be. until you have patience. Right. It'll force yes. you into it. That's right. So, so let's go back to those failure modes again, that last slide, and finish up on uh, – there we go. So explore stars application, move mountain wrong direction, points to the floor. Um, there's generally two functions that I have. First off, believe it or not, I ask people to make sure the telescope is pointing up and not down when they start. And that's happened <laughs> more than a couple of times. Hmm. And uh, the other one is uh, you have a, if they're in the Western hemisphere, they have a positive number instead of a negative number and so it thinks it's at you know 94 degrees east which is in belarus or somewhere so you know i need to figure out exactly where we would be in 3694 is in in europe because that would be the opposite side from us uh and does not does not point accurately boy that's a can of worms right there for only four words yeah Uh, there's that's a lot of features right and There's I got a, a I got a, I've got a document I created that I put online. Uh, let me let me bring that document up. I think you know the one I'm talking about. Are you talking about the 28 points of failure? Yeah. Yep. Uh-huh. Yeah. So while you're doing that, ask 28 does... points of failure. That sounds like one of my first dates. <laughs> yeah. So this uh, document is a wonderful read. You know, this really breaks down what astrophotographers face to the point of, I mean, really gets down to some minutia. And if only we could all get that point to where we're worried about things that add a tenth or a fifteenth of an of an arc second, you know, to to our perfection. Mm-hmm. Uh, but but like anything else, don't worry about the little stuff. Worry about the big stuff that makes a big right. effect. Right. Don't go There's, to don't say, oh, my pulley gear wobbles one sixty fourth of a fraction of an inch. It's invisible. Worry about your cone error, for instance. Yeah, that talks that talks to a, a concept that I didn't that I didn't include in the list, which is called uh, uh, margin and balancing balancing the errors across your whole system. There's no sense in, in in increasing the performance in one area of your mount if it's overshadowed by another area of your mount. Uh, if it's overwhelmed, you, you know you 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 can hyperventilate about uh, PE, but you don't you don't care about focus. <laughs> you know, right, like, right. <laughs> or you don't care about something else that that. Oh, yeah. so that's what this document's all about. Is what are the things that get it? What are the things that impact your imaging and what keeps you from getting a perfect astrophotograph? Basically, perfect. So, so there, like like uh, Kent said, there's probably 25 or 30 of these things, and I'm actually I counted them one. I think there's tw- 28 sticks in my head. Yeah, 28. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So Bill Black is wanting to know if I only made 28. I only had 28 points of failure. <laughs> <laughs> After 28, it's like a blur, dude. <laughs> Right. <laughs> and so, Jerry, did you compile this all from experience? Was this, say, a, 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 a sort of a, a, a pretty much Einstein thought exercise on some of these? No, it's based on my my years of knowledge. You know, my yeah. my minuscule years of knowledge I've had with astrophotography. I really am not as, you know, I'm not as experienced as a lot of people are that out there. I don't. I don't get into uh, pretty picture imaging. I get into scientific imaging, but I get into the equipment and understanding where the problem is. So that's what that's right. That's, that's why I was able to jumpstart my career in this area pretty quickly because I was I was passionate about it, learning how everything worked, and it took me four years to learn just about everything about it. 
Now, I don't remember all that stuff, but every time there's a there's a problem that pops up, I I get I get to retrain myself or reacquaint myself with these things. But so this this document is based on so discussions I've had over the years and the, and my experience and uh, and my my engineering background being able to uh, separate these things out into specific things in specific terms. So and uh, keep scrolling through this because this is a, an astoundingly long list. Yeah. So there's a lot of optical stuff. There's a lot of mount stuff. There's a lot of you know environmental behaviors there's just a lot of things that people will attribute to their mount that's not really the mount problem and until you are aware of these things you don't really you don't really understand that so and again some of these are pretty small the, yeah the they're going to be small and just watching you scroll through these stop right there the uh, scintillation errors, you know, the atmospheric scene is probably, other than bad focus and bad tracking, you can only get what the sky gives. Right. And, and right. And there's a term in here. Um, I don't know where it is exactly, but there are, you can have high clouds, okay, when you're imaging and you're not, not seeing them. Oh, yeah. So you and can't it'll even look really like see with the naked eye. You can't see them. Right. It'll look like your mount is not tracking right. You get oval stars. But it's the smearing effect of the clouds hmm. on the star image. It's not nothing to do with your mount at all. It's not the PMC-8 unit. It's not the tracking. It's, it's not, not the, the tracking. Camera. It's not anything. It's, the, it's just the fact that the clouds are smearing the light across the frame. And the sky is not giving it to you tonight. Right. So if you get if you get intermittent problems like this where you have one night your tracking is perfect, but the next night is not, and the next night is perfect again, don't don't consider it totally as a quality problem with the mount that it's that it's not consistent in its operation. The mount can become consistent in its operation if you set it up correctly in the same way every time. Once it gets once it gets that you get to that point then when you start seeing these intermittent changes in performance then it's environmental it's outside the mount that's a that's an important concept to understand all right so let's go back to the other thing let's see um wolf king says i have a question about the ixs 100 why is at the top where the telescope is connected uh, the one side straight and the other side has a hole like a half circle. I'm going to um, look at, I'm going to look at the mount real quick. Hang on. Yeah. I think he's talking about the, uh, saddle plate up there. Puck, the saddle plate. Yeah. Okay. So he's talking about the saddle plate. Yeah. Uh, on the side where, these the the bolt and the safety bolt screw through yeah is uh shaped like it's got a concave curve in it well it's on you're looking at it from the top yeah and the other side is sort of shaped like that so So, you want me to stop sharing? Yeah, you need to stop sharing because yeah, can't Chance video is about one inch by one inch. Yeah. So, are we up now? Okay. All right. Okay. Yep. So, so looking at it, this is the saddle plate right here where the VIX can goes through, and this piece is where the bolts go through right here. And if I look, and I had never noticed it before. But this piece, instead of being straight like this side, has a little half moon. It almost looks like a half moon. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not sure why that is. Um, Does it just provide two points of contact instead of the whole thing so it's a little that's more probably accurate? It. Yeah. It's, yeah, that's what it is. Yep, there you go. That's it. 
Because if yeah. you have a flat surface, it could not be. It might not be perfectly flat, and you can sit there, and it'll flexure well, will yeah. happen. Right. This gives them more of a bite. Yeah. Two right. points. It presses better. Mm -hmm. Yep. More of a bite. So um, okay. Uh, uh, well, Jerry, yeah. that's, that's a pretty impressive um, uh, document that you have there. And um, I think will be very useful for people. The next thing I know, people are going to ask me to make it hyperlinked so that it, uh, you click on the uh, problem. <laughs> oh yeah, actually, well, that's, that's something I should do. That's something that we should. Be, do. I mean, that could be a big doc. That could be a big document if we go yeah. to explain further. What's yeah, going what's on wrong? With all this Boom. Stuff, right? Click on that. Oh, it should be this. Boom. Okay. Mm -hmm. Click on that. And yeah, but that document is on the groups I O. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's under, under the base. mount on the mount file system or the main. I can't remember where I put I'm it. I'm looking right now. Yeah, Jerry, that's something you and I can work on together. You can convert the the document to HTML. We can pop right. it into a page and start. Um, it's the mount. It's under mount. Doing it. That's where I'm looking now. It's under mounts. A taxonomy of stellar imaging errors. Two. PDF. Yep. It's under the mounts form. Yeah, that's a good, that was a great exercise for me to really nail down and document. I like to mm -hmm. document things because uh, I don't always remember everything, especially when it comes to this type of engineering problem when you're really trying to nail down. And this is what it takes to nail down precisely what's going on. Right. That's what these people that do the greatest world class photographs. They're concerned with these things. Oh, sure. Sure. And that's any kind of photography, really. Mm -hmm. uh, I've, you know, I've sent that document to people before to, you know, who, who just didn't, I couldn't get them to understand the, uh, the overwhelming nature of what they're trying to, why the sky and I'm not making this stuff up and here this thing is. And they're like, Wow. <laughs> You know, it's really yeah. eye-opening. Yeah. Right. Right. Now, we're pretty far into our show, but uh, we should probably give some people a chance to answer the question of the day, get the answer, right? Right. And What's so what the, is our question of the day? Well, let's get the price first. Let's let them know what they're going to win. Okay. I don't know what they're going to win. We're out of muffs, so we can't give away any muffs. Um, no. So a flashlight, red light flashlight, and a Wiltarian planisphere. How about that? Okay, That's good, a deal. good bunch of swag, worth okay. about pushing forty dollars US. Yeah, That's All right. Not bad. So Scott, what's the question? Well, the question is: is we wanted to know what day did Jerry Hubble make his now famous prediction? Okay, <laughs> actually, it's not famous, not yet. But if he's right, it will be. Uh, what day did Jerry um, predict that we would pass 500 members? Now, we're not asking what day he said we were going to pass 500. What day did he announce that he thought we would announce five, pass oh. 500 in August? Okay. okay. All right. So, and there's a hint. Is, there's yeah, a so hint. the clue is, what's the clue, Jerry? The clue is that that was the same day that I announced when we got to 400 members. Now, now he's not announcing. This is not the date that he said we were going to reach 500. Actually, be 500. It's the day, oh, the day that, that he's he not making the prediction. The prediction I this say. is the date he made the prediction. Okay. The it's date the same he made day, the prediction. It's the same day he announced the 400 that we had reached 400 members, right? right. I will tell you this. It's not in August because that's when he said we would reach 500. So it's not August. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, we're watching. The, the uh, okay. So August. we already have some dates here. Um, Ken says August 2nd. Mr. Thump 30 says August 3rd. Bill Black no. says August 3rd. No, it's not August. It's the date. Yeah, back is, in the past yeah. when I when we reached four hundred when we reached four hundred <laughs> members. I'll, I'll Terry Lariman says yesterday. 
I'll even give this hint. It wasn't even in July. Okay. All right. Eduardo says May 12th. Ken says Monday. Wolfgang says July 20th. The, the answer is in the forums. If somebody takes the time to go look real quick, they should be able to find it because it's not like. What hidden. was that date that you said Eduardo said? He said uh, May 12th. 12th. Okay. May 12th. Uh, Jeff Y says uh, July 7th. Um, Angela says July 14th. There's no sense. Eduardo guess saying May 12th again. <laughs> it, 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 fellas, I'm telling you, you can find the answer. Whoever can search the form the fastest will find it. Yeah, it, you have to go to the forum. Hidden. These qu Every question we ask from now on, unless it's a special day. Yeah, you got to go to the forum to get the, form. the, uh, get the answer. That's right. Dusty Haskins says September 1st. Uh, Jeff Wise says June 17th. <laughs> Jim Norwood wants to use the Mayan calendar. <laughs> uh, That's a good idea. <laughs> I have trouble converting, you know. May 22nd, Eduardo. Ding, ding, ding. What? Yep. May 22nd, yep. Eduardo said. So where did where did Eduardo get May twelfth from? He probably Eduardo, where'd you get May twelfth from? Do that do that sound effect again, Scott? I didn't hear it. Where'd he get it? Sound effect. Where'd you get you just did a sound effect and it got cut off. <laughs> do it again. Do it again? Play right. the sound effect. All right. This one? <laughs> no, no, the, you guys would like that. This one, he knew it was May sometime. He said, He's not looking at my picture. This one, no. Robert, Robert, <laughs> oh, that one, <laughs> Robert Trepiccione says, Bad time to be driving, ah, especially if you knew the answer, sir. Yes, all right. So, uh, Eduardo, uh, send me an email at service at explorescientific.com put attention kent uh prize winner and uh i will get you your prize shipped yeah. out to you and bill black says on tuesday may 12th at 10 4 a.m jerry hubble explore scientific vp of engineering wrote i think we are on track to exceed 500 members by the end of august 2020 yep I see. That's why Eduardo said May 12th. That's when I first said something. But then I, I made the announcement uh, when we reached 400. Right. And predicted the 500. Now, let's see. Let's just, uh, this, I haven't looked in today. Uh, we're at, it uh, helps if you go to the correct home group. We're currently at, no. 479, I think. I, that's, uh, 480. We've gained one. Uh, 480. 480. Okay. So, uh, there's one new. 480 now, right now. Now I I did something over the uh, weekend that might have put a dent in some of it because we had a few people leave. I I remind I sent out emails to people to remind them to create their display name mm -hmm. on the forum because it's nicer to know what their names are. Sure. Uh, with that instead of having nothing there. So, uh, I think I upset a couple people because they left. So, so look, so look, y'all, y'all don't know this. But you wanted to know who they were? No. no. Fine. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. But it, that's why the number isn't more than 480 right now. It would have been 481. Oh, that's or 482. your excuse. <laughs> but it's still on track. I mean, I think it's still on track. To okay. What I say. So, so here's the deal. If we, if we break, and Jerry's agreed to this, although he didn't know it yet. If we break. <laughs> 400, 500 in July. Yeah. Jerry is going to do the show without his ball cap on. I got to get a haircut. I, uh, you know, that's, you got to do the show without your ball cap on. So I can, well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you didn't know you agreed to that, but you did. So there you go. Right. I'll, maybe, I'll, maybe we should uh, have no. something to where we all have to dye our hair bright yellow or something. And, and I am not shaving my mustache off. So don't even ask. 
Yeah, that's that's the thing. Half of your mustache, just half. I, I'll I'll shave my eyebrows before I shave my mustache. Okay, you're on. <laughs> I said I would shave. I didn't say I would do it. I said I would before. <laughs> you I said you would do it. I I think those in the audience heard him say that he would do it, right? <laughs> oh yeah, that's what I heard. That's my eyebrows, heard. my eyebrows would go back a lot that's quicker right. than my mustache will. <laughs> Dave Conley says that's like asking you to the edge to take off his hat. <laughs> uh, uh, Jeff Wise wants to know if he can join twice. We'd oh, love okay. for you to do. Okay, I'm Bill Black. For you, I'll shave my head. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> I already do that. He already did that. I like your thinking, Bill. I like your thinking. Mr. Kent is a foot model. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Kent looks better with his mustache. Mustache, yeah. Mustache. Well, I had to get rid of my Corona beard. Astro Beard says, uh, I lost my eyebrows. Got to love potatoes, guns. <laughs> uh, little flaming. Uh, Those grow are. back, Kent. That's right. Shave it. They want you to shave the mustache. Uh, that mustache has been on there since 19 or 20. My wife. You can't. Talking. You guys don't know this about Ken. Now I'll, I'll tell okay. you a secret about him. Okay. Every year, Ken is Santa Claus, and he has to have that mustache. So that's right. Okay. If everybody well, wants maybe one day we'll get him to wear his Santa Claus outfit. Well, I was going through some boxes the other day. And if you want to know what I look like without a mustache, that's what I look like without a mustache. My junior year in college, you think? That's me. That's I you. Have, I also have dark hair, so you, there you, you go. look like an '80s uh, movie star. Yeah, so. your your hair is really short compared to yeah. what mine was. Uh, other other people have suggested with after I grew the mustache that it was more like an '80s porn star, but. Uh, <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> there we go that's me without a mustache yeah maybe your, your hair is pretty short i mean my my hair was down to my shoulders when i was i never had long hair that uh, long yeah. yeah i had long hair too man yep. i had long but, hair too richard nixon didn't like it so. <laughs> thank you dave i agree i am which no made me grow it longer <laughs> dave conley says he is no burt reynolds i agree totally i am not a burt reynolds uh-huh we have devolved so, again gentlemen yeah so are we done with the uh is there any more questions about i think that's it we're getting some nice comments here i think people are gonna uh start chanting for uh kent to shave his mustache off so <laughs> <clears throat> okay gentlemen i think that's it um do we have any more comments for our for our audience here our live audience well, i think that was our only topic for today right with the and the yeah, prize. it was yeah it was a yeah. pretty good one though um uh yeah, if anybody has any questions email me about well, troubleshooting problems you know if you have any ideas and these and, and for these documents or stuff like that and these guidelines yeah. uh, i'm gonna I'll, I'll probably work on these more in the future well to help and, customers and also, send us what you want to talk about i mean this is the company's your company the show's your show that's uh, true let us know you know what y'all want to talk about and some ideas and I know we've had, you know, there's some problems, you know, that, that I saw in the stream that we didn't address. Um, send those to us and we can can address some of those things. That's right. That's right. All right. Well, uh, thank you to everyone. Uh, uh, I am, uh, we are still confirmed for having uh, Abigail Bolenbach on Friday at 11 o'clock central. So she's going to be give us, giving us an update. Uh, so if you want to catch Abigail, she's always uh, full of great information. And uh, um, until that time uh, that we see you tomorrow, you guys keep looking up and take care. Thanks, everyone.